Daniel Schroeter, who is a professor of Jewish history at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Um, he's published extensively about uh, Morocco and the Jews of Morocco. The um, talk that he's giving us today is a joint effort of Daniel Schroeter and Professor Yosef Shitrit. Um, Daniel, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Judith, and also thank you for all your work that you've uh, been putting into organizing the conference. And I'd also want to thank the Ben Svi Institute and the University of Haifa, um, especially uh, uh, Haim Sadun uh, and and uh, Yossi Shitrit, my collaborator from the University of Haifa. And I just want to say that this uh, presentation is part of a, an ongoing uh, collaboration that uh, Professor Shitrit and I have had um, on the transformation of rock and Jewish communities o over a kind of long period of time. Uh, but, I, but I also want to say, and I'm just looking out at the, many of my friends and colleagues in the room, how much also we're we're building on on the foundational research that has been done by um, uh, some some of the people in in this room today. So I'm, I, I feel very honored to be able to present uh, present this research. Um, before the period of mass immigration of Jews that began began in the 1950s, Morocco consisted of several hundred Jewish communities living in diverse socio-cultural, linguistic, and geographic environments. These communities were not static, but were part of a dynamic process of migration over hundreds of years, with communities developing in new locales, disappearing from others, or, especially in the larger urban centers, transformed by the influx or outflux of Jews of diverse linguistic and cultural groups. Despite the diversity of Jewish communities and the variety of habitats in what became the Moroccan nation state, scholars have often assumed anachronistically a kind of timeless and singular entity referred to as Moroccan Jewry. Uh, that it is, had existed for a thousand or even two thousand years, and have made generalizations about Moroccan Jews based on fragmentary or episodic evidence that ignores the heterogeneity and the hybridity of Jewish life in Morocco. Much of the scholarship confuses identity with the singular Morocco or Moroccan Jewry of the present, with a much more set a diverse set of linguistic uh, uh, identities, of cultural identities that existed in the past. Defining Moroccan Jewry as a singularity necessitates using the country of Morocco as a framework of analysis and consequently examining the interaction and relationship of the Jewish minority to the Muslim majority, identifying both the commonalities and differences between the two faith communities. And while scholars often debate the similarities and differences between Muslims and Jews of Morocco, or whether Muslim-Jewish relations were either harmonious or fraught with tension, most scholarship share in the idea of, of an almost essential Moroccanness of the Jews. Um, as an example, Clifford Geertz, in his well-known essay on the Moroccan souk, uh, based on field work in Sefru, writes about the paradox of the Moroccan Jewish community. And I quote, from many points of view, it looks exactly like the Muslim community, from as many others totally different. Moroccan to the core, and Jewish to the same core. They were heritors of a tr tradition, double and indivisible, and in no way marginal." Unquote. Perhaps unwittingly, Geertz's binary artfully represents the contradictory equation that most scholars share about Moroccan Jews, that they are both simultaneously totally the same and totally different. 
The problem, I think, in our opinion with this insight is that it assumes a kind of primordial ethnic identity that can be described as Moroccan. Our collaborative study seeks to rethink the history and culture of what has been called Moroccan Jewry by analyzing a greater diversity of sources and texts, elite and popular, written and oral, internal and external in the diverse languages used in Morocco by Muslims and Jews, or written about Muslims and Jews by outsiders. We propose that there is a need to differentiate between collective memory that imagines a shared identity uniting Moroccan Jewry as a whole and an interpretation of how a culture came to be constituted and identified with Morocco. We begin by analyzing how Moroccan Jewry identity was constructed, paying attention to how it represented itself and, and was represented by others. We assert that a Moroccan Jewry was constituted by a multiplicity of contexts, environments, and dynamic historical processes that need to be differentiated in time, say from the 16th through the 21st centuries, and space, urban, rural, diaspora, um, you know, the, and the various locations where Moroccan Jews came to be identified or to identify themselves. Until the end of the 15th century, which marked the final expulsion um, of Jewish communities from the Iberian Peninsula, it would be difficult to argue that anything resembling a Moroccan Jewish culture existed. Jews who lived in Morocco were part of a larger cultural arena of the Western Mediterranean, Hispano-Arabic communities, marked by a high level of mobility that connected Jews to, to the Mediterranean. The expulsion of Jews... Uh, at the end of uh, Muslim Spain, together with the triangular Iberian-Moroccan-Ottoman contest that moved to the North African shores of the Mediterranean, brought a sharper political divide in the Western Mediterranean that resulted in, a major, trans in major transformations in Jewish society. Of course, uh, this, this isn't to suggest that the boundaries were firmly uh, or, or medically sealed. Uh, there continued to be you know, quite a bit of fluidity of crossing religious boundaries between uh, Morocco and the Iberian Peninsula, as, as, as Jose Tavim's presentation. We just we we heard about these many crossings uh, that that continue to take place after the end of the uh, after the um, end of the 15th century. But the, but still, there was an important political divide. I think that is significant here. Um, and in its successful struggle to maintain its independence from the dual assault from both the Iberian and Ottoman empires, Morocco developed a more distinctive political culture as well um, as um, a greater sense of territoriality than did other parts of the Maghreb in the pre-modern period. This was marked by the emergence of the Sharifian dynastic state basing its legitimacy on the genealogical descent from the prophet that became the unifying principle that transcended, uh, in theory, sovereignty based on tribal descent. Um, the development of the dynastic Sharifian state, first the Saadians, then the Alawids, coincided also with the tremendous growth of Jewish communities living within the territorial confines of the country, with the influx of Iberian Jews and their descendants settling not only in major urban centers of Fez and Marrakesh, but also fanning out in diverse regions of Morocco, especially along Morocco's most important uh, trade routes. Jewish communities were not only crucial for the Moroccan dynasty and elites and linking center and periphery by networks of trade, they also became increasingly linked to each other. Jews also mirrored Muslim communities insofar as the elites gravitated towards the centers of imperial power. As the Alawid capital oscillated between Fez and Marrakesh and for a period of time Meknes, the most hegemonic uh, Jewish communities and centers of cultural and political influence were found in places of Sharifian royal authority. It was in these urban centers that the Melas of Morocco first developed, first Fez, then Marrakesh and Meknes. Significantly, the Melas developed and became, became identified as a distinctive feature of Moroccan Jewish life. 
While these centers that were close to the Alawid capitals exercised a degree of authority over other Jewish communities in Morocco, there remained nevertheless regional rivalries and a large measure of autonomy. Jews often remained fiercely loyal to the town or local community of origin. Obviously not a, a phenomenon that's unique to Morocco or to Jews, um, but uh, at the same time, they they recognized the authority of leaders of the larger Jewish community in their region. But this recognition did not uh, imply that such a thing as Moroccan Jewry as an institutional entity nor as an imagined community existed before modern times. While it is anachronistic to speak of Moroccan Jewry on a national level, uh, the development of a common uh, Moroccan Jewish culture within the shifting boundaries of the Alawid state occurred over the course of several centuries. It was nevertheless diverse yet different, differentiated from other Jewish cultures of the Maghreb and Eastern Mediterranean. In this sense, Jews were only mirroring the Muslim populations who could be described similarly as constituting a kind of synthesis of its diverse linguistic cultures and ethnicities. These identities that later define Moroccan Jewry were on the one hand, one hand self-ascriptive, formed internally by individual communities in relationship to the more universal aspects of, of Judaism, the larger Jewish world, but articulated in the realities of the Moroccan milieu. On the other hand, ascriptive identities, defined by the different types of status imposed by the various hegemonic authorities. So in Morocco, like other Muslim countries, this involved their status as dhimmis, a constant factor in which the Islamic state and legal system define the Jews' place in society, imposing boundaries with the dominant majority and providing stability and security for Jews in normal circumstances and instability and uncertainty in times of unrest and anarchy. In modern times, forces originating outside of Morocco began to impose new definitions of Jewish status. European powers that granted extraterritorial rights and sometimes nationality, foreign Jewish uh, organizations and leaders, especially British, French, later American, you know, from Montefiore, the Alliance, Anglo-Jewish Association, the, the Joint, uh, Ort, and so forth, um, that, that paternalistically provided education and aid to their co-religionists with the objective of improving and redefining their status, but often resulting in alienating and destabilizing the communities with their disregard to both elite and popular Jewish culture. From the Middle Ages, rabbinical culture was co constitutive of Jewish culture, a habitus that was accepted and assumed, yet reinforced both by, on the one hand, the hegemonic Muslim society that also lived in accordance with its faith and religious practices, and that required that the Jews also conduct themselves according to their religious rules. And on the other hand, by the Jews' dread of conversion to Islam, the existential threat to Jewish survival. In addition to this more universal aspect of rabbinical culture, Jewish identity was also formed at the local community level, either in the large or medium-sized urban centers endowed with a semi-autonomous culture and judicial status and ruled by two local oligarchies, the rabbinic and merchant elites, or in the rural communities that lived among Berber-speaking environments, often cut off from the major urban centers of leadership. Local community identities were off, often formed by, uh, by the assertion of their distinctiveness from other communities, whom they often viewed as rivals or even with enmity, at times engaging in polemics, uh, as was in the case especially well known between Meknes and Fez. The encounter with European modernity during the course of the 19th century caused Jewish identity in Morocco to become more diffuse, first as a result of contact with Europeans and migration to the commercial centers and port cities such as Isuira, Mogador, Tangier, and then with the education provided in the Alliance schools, which together with other modern schools greatly expanded during the protectorate period in the 20th century. These new secular identities did not necessarily replace the old, but often coexisted in tension with the formally totalizing Jewish community 
where one's very existence outside the communal structures have been an impossibility. In other words, the encounter with European modernity and education reconstituted Moroccan Jewish identity as each family or even individuals within families could now choose from the range of old or new elements that constituted Jewish life from both inside or outside the organized Jewish uh, community. It's, it's rather ironic in, in this rupture with the local Jewish community structure that one can locate the origins of the idea of Moroccan Jewry as a collectivity on a national scale. Identification with one's country was increasingly, for the modernizing Jewish elite, the sine qua non of modernity. Yet it was European cultural and political influence, rather than legal or political changes in Morocco, that began to instill in the Jewish population a sense of belonging to the larger Moroccan community. Particularly important in this regard was the conquest of uh, Algeria. This was significant for Jews in Morocco for a number of reasons. The first is that Morocco became circumscribed by the Algerian border, which previously had been much more porous, and that resulted in defining Moroccan Jews separately. Furthermore, Algerian Jews became French citizen by, citizens by the Cremieux Decree, of 1870, as, as we just uh, uh, heard, um, severing them from the native Muslim population. Amid these changes, Western educated Jews in Morocco, who remained very small in number and who began to identify culturally and politically with European countries, especially France and even increasingly Spain, came to see themselves collectively as Moroccan. This did not contradict a growing identification with the modernizing agendas of European countries or even with the nation state to which the elite was becoming acculturated. Yet such a Moroccan identification which was articulated by a very few among the educated elite and especially the alumni of the Alliance uh, remained very abstract and hardly took on any kind of institutional form before the 20th century. The idea that Jews of Morocco constituted a single collectivity took shape within the reorganization and centralization of the Jewish community during the colonial period which began in 1912. Although in theory the protectorate was to preserve the existing system of governance which implied recognizing the legal distinction between Jewish and Muslim communities, the French authorities also sought to modernize and reform the country with the notion of granting certain individual liberties, yet progressively seeking to reorganize and reform the Jewish community that could be controlled centrally on a national scale. Naum Slush who was appointed by the colonial authorities to study the Jewish communities and devise a plan for their reorganization, proposed that a representative assembly, a general consistory or Sanhedrin, as he called it, be established for Moroccan Jewry as a whole. This proposal was rejected by the colonial authorities, for they feared that it would lead down the long, slippery slope to emancipation, as had occurred in Algeria which they considered to be an error. Instead, the French residency preferred to keep Jews as subjects of the Sultan while disempowering the autonomy of the local community at the same time. Um, the more modest reforms decreed between 1918 and 1919 nevertheless constituted an important institutional step for Moroccan Jewry as, as a whole. The protectorate authorities established a more uniform system for local community councils, the Comité, and the establishment of a higher rabbinical court, which was to serve as an appellate court presided over by a newly created position of chief rabbi. In addition to a kind of national rabbinic leadership that developed, a new post at the national level the Inspector General of Jewish Institutions, was created to serve as an instrument of the French administration for dealing with Jewish affairs. However, these national institutional developments remained largely formal and official and had little effect in the period before World War II, instilling a sense of belonging to a single collectivity called Moroccan Judaism. 
Somewhat more influential, however, was the growth of modern education, especially through the expanding network of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which had a quasi-national status under the protectorate for Moroccan Jews. Growing male and female literacy, together with the development and dissemination of Jewish publications and newspapers, were important in the construction of an imagined community as an increasing number of Jews identified themselves as part of a larger collectivity of Moroccan Judaism or Moroccan Jewry. World War II was a crucial turning point for the construction of Moroccan Jewry. The experience of the war years, especially under the Vichy anti-Jewish laws, which singled out Jews in Morocco um, as, as a, basically, at least in theory, without distinction between regions and social class, served to strengthen horizontal ties on a national level. It also propelled the protectorate authorities in the late stages of colonial rule that followed the, law, the, the war to initiate further national reforms of the Jewish community in an effort to strengthen its hold on the country by maintaining or regaining the loyalty of Moroccan Jews as the, um, as the Moroccan independence movement was born. And, and here I'll, I'll try to summarize a little bit the, my, sort of the final section of the paper. Um, but, but basically it was following the war, uh, the Second World War, that the Jewish community was, was, was reorganized and the original decrees of 1918 uh, were, were reformed by creating sort of national representative institutional bodies for Moroccan Jewry as, as a whole, the Conseil de Communauté Israelite du Maroc, for example, uh, reorganizing um, the, uh, the rabbinate through a sort of uh, 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 Conseil Supérieur de Tribunal Rabbinique, which was created with the idea that they would have cer certain kind of jurisdiction over Morocco as, as a whole, even though at that stage uh, you know, the rabbis' uh, uh, leadership, the rabbinical leadership, imagined themselves as representing a kind of rock and jury as a whole, uh, but ironically their, their own uh, institutional basis and power had been greatly reduced, uh, nevertheless, by, by colonialism. Um, so there were various efforts to institutionalize uh, Moroccan Jewry as a whole, as a collect collectivity, um, and of course this came very much in conjunction uh, with, the Moroc uh, with the colonial state that was established but also with the emergence of the King of Morocco. Um, it's important here, though, to stress that the Moroccan Jewry was largely detached from the nationalist and independence movement to which very few Jews associated. But Jews became Moroccan citizens after independence, integrated in theory into the national body with, as I quote, uh, Mohammed V, uh, shortly before independence with the same rights and duties as other Moroccans. And there were a few, certainly Jews, who were brought into the government as part of the euphoria of a unified country that followed independence. But um, while the official rhetoric of Jews as equal citizens continued, um, the, uh, there were various reasons, you might say, that worked against uh, creating a kind of a civil consciousness and notion of Moroccan Jews as sort of citizens of a, the independent Moroccan state and most um, most uh, Jews left uh, left Morocco in mass of course beginning in the 1950s um, and, and the, the notion that Jews are woven into the cultural fabric of the country is one of the n a number of ethnic groups that constitute the nation, which was enunciated in the preamble to the new Moroccan constitution in 2011, remains largely the discourse of officials and the Muslim educated elite. Yet, if most Moroccans would find it difficult to think of Jews as Moroccan, Jews in the larger Moroccan diaspora have in some ways become even more Moroccan than when living in their place of origin. Jews in Morocco, in Israel, in the 1950s, uh, that is, 
sort of identified as Jews in Morocco and Israel in the 1950s, they become the symbolic other and were labeled and stigmatized as Morocaim or Morocco Sakin in Israel, prompting many Moroccans to deny their Moroccan origins, uh, claiming instead to be French, uh, which was considered much higher in the pecking order. Uh, and, uh, and I'll conclude uh, here. Um, the reclamation of a Moroccan identity in Israel, France, and other countries of the dispersion really came two decades later after this period of mass uh, migration and sometimes even by the second generation of immigrants. This diaspora identity construction is of course not unique uh, and is found among other transnational communities who develop networks of ties and imagine connections to their ancestral homeland. Perhaps a latent response to deracination the assertion of one's Moroccanness marks the transition from being a separate religious community in Morocco to being a distinctive minority ethnic community with transnational ties in the countries of the Moroccan dispersion. Thank you. We have time for a few uh, brief questions, so. If anybody would like to ask, nobody. Well, then we'll be able to keep the schedule. Um, Ken, Kasha. אני <laughs> רק בזמן האחרון ממש אנחנו מדברים על זה. ואם מחפשים ממש זהות, ישנה זהות אחת, בין שלא התייחסת עליה, זה כל הזהות, כל העימות הזה בין התושבים לבין הספרדים. כן, ובשלב מסוים, כן, במאה ה-17, רבנים אחרותות קיבלו החלטה שהיא באמת החלטה של זהות, כן, לגבי נישואים. כן, שכל היהודים תושבי מרוקו, שהם בני הצפון, פחות או יותר עד למויין הקלאס, כן? הם שייכים, כן, לתושבים, סליחה, לספרדים, ולכן הנישואים שלהם הם לפי כללי קסטיליה, וכל מה שהוא דרומי זה תושבים, וכאן אנחנו רואים, כן, שלפי החלוקה הזאת, כן, יש כבר משהו של זהות. Ne m'interrompez pas, monsieur. D'accord Mais ne parlez pas tellement long. Monsieur, ne m'interrompez pas. D'accord Soyez poli. Moi, au contraire, c'est vous. D'accord. Alors, donc, la femme, qu'il y a des gens qui ont des routes, mais même plus vite, qu'il y a des gens qui ont des intérêts à l'âme, mais c'est quoi ma mère à l'âme Avant, il y a des routes marocaines, les dates, c'est un peu autre chose, c'est l'eau de la nouvelle à l'âme. Joël, j'avais juste une, une question à vous dire, en fait, tu, tu, tu remarques. Le, à partir de 1870, quand les Juifs algériens sont devenus français, il n'était plus question de faire appel au rabbin de France. En fait, il était de moins en moins question de faire appel au rabbin de France parce qu'ils étaient aussi français que, 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 que ces rabbins, et d'autant plus que le niveau rabbinique, de, en fait, c'est là, là le grand oui. problème, oui. c'est le niveau rabbinique des rabbins de France n'était pas euh, très, très élevé, ils avaient surtout un niveau de d'instituteur, 
je réponds rapidement. Si, bien sûr qu'après 1870, il y a eu encore des, des rabbins alsaciens, puisque... Alsaciens, c'est toujours vrai. Alsaciens, c'est toujours vrai. Alsaciens, c'est toujours vrai. Le premier rabbin était le rabbin Ashkenazi, c'est vrai, on le sait. Non, ça c'est le premier rabbin Ashkenazi était séfarade. Oui, oui, le premier. Non, mais le premier rabbin de France né en Algérie, c'est en 1981 en France. Bon. Mais en 1870, il y avait Abraham Cain, justement, qui était grand rabbin à Constantine. Oui, mais après, mais allez, je vais vous avez... diminuer le nom. Le nom aussi. Euh, J'entends pas. Après 1870, oui. leur nom diminue. Leur nom diminue, mais les rabbins, euh, rabbins d'Algérie sont français, oui, oui, mais qui sont considérés encore comme des indigènes par les autorités françaises. Ce sont des indigènes français. Bon, ils, ils n'ont pas du tout le même niveau. Alors maintenant, quand à leur érudition. C'est vrai que l'érudition des rabbins d'Algérie était très importante. Je ne crois pas que ceux de France avaient que le niveau d'instituteur. C'était aussi des érudits. Vous savez aussi bien que moi, si ce n'est mieux, que euh, ces rabbins ont fait des travaux archéologiques, par exemple. Non, pas d'érudition rabbinique. Oui, d'accord, mais voilà. Érudition rabbinique peut-être moindre, mais c'était des, des érudits aussi en, en sciences profanes, ce que n'étaient pas du tout les rabbins d'Algérie. Le rabbin qui a, bon. qui a écrit la première histoire des Juifs. Oui, absolument, absolument. C'est ça, c'est celui-là qui a écrit des, euh, le, sur les, les instructions tumulaires de l'Est consentinois, etc. Il savait beaucoup de choses, mais effectivement, il n'était pas, en tout cas au niveau du Talmud, il n'était pas aussi compétent que les rabbins d'Algérie, que les rabbins d'Algérie, c'est vrai. Well, I, I, I agree, I agree with uh, most of the your observations, uh, Michel. I would just add, though, I think that uh, the the division the division between Toshavim and uh, you know the Toshavim and Sfaradim that uh, that that sort of got worked out over a, 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 a few centuries, but the divisions which remained and so forth. Nevertheless, the, I mean, this kind of underscores both the diversity within Morocco, but I would also add here that it, that that this was, you know, these categories were really very much a part of a kind of elite discourse or elite rabbinical discourse. It wasn't, people didn't, you know, in, in terms of sort of their self-identification in previous centuries, didn't think of themselves so much in those terms that we, you know, we, we sort of base our conclusions on, basically on rabbinical texts that write about such things. Um, I, I would certainly argue and You'll see, she might have some other things to add, add to that, but um, did, do you want to say something? Yes. Michel, the difference between the Toshavim and the Toshavim is that the Toshavim is זה לא העניין של זהות, אלא זה העניין של רכוש. והעדיפו, במשפחות מעורבות, העדיפו להתחתן לפי מסורת זו או זו, על פי חלוקת הרכוש הצפויה. לבנות. לבנות וכולי. ולכן קשה מאוד לקבוע את הגורם הזה כעוגן זהותי כל כך. אני, עם כל ה... מאות אלפים של אנשים שראיינתי ודיברתי איתם בכל הנושא, בנושא של יהודי מרוקו בארבעים השנים האחרונות. פעם אחת ביחידה שמעתי אחרינו השושבים. מפי מפי של הרב הראשי היום במרוקו, שהיה עדיין צעיר אולי היה רב, הרב מונסונגו. זה צרם לי כל כך שפשוט כי לא הבנתי מה פתאום אחינו התושבים כאשר הוא מתנהג בדיוק אותם And just the other, the other part of the comment, uh, also, uh, which I think is 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 also a, I don't really di disagree so much. I mean, the the idea of rock and jewelry and the categories that are sometimes used now uh, are, are a fairly recent derivation, but institutionally during the the colonial period, you begin hearing discussion about. Uh, you know, Moroccan Jews as a single collectivity. I would certainly, and, and that was reflected both in some of the writings and the 
you know, journalistic uh, writings, as well as, um, and whether they called themselves Jews of Morocco, nevertheless, the point is that it was somehow they constituted one collective group. And that, that was really, I think, the point that I was trying to, uh, uh, trying to st uh, stress. And even the, uh, you know, with the institutional reforms, they started talking about the kihila being, you know, a, a singularity. Uh, in, in ways that they never had before. So that, I think that's what I was, that, that we were trying to stress um, uh, with, with that point. Now how that translates into identity, of course, is, is much more compli complicated, as you said, with the, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate in the American uh, academia about identity, and it's, it's o or even overuse because it's such a, a fluid and fluid category. It's a sort of difficult so sometimes to pen down what what, what is, one means as identity. So, but thank you for your, your observations. I think yeah. you'll see my other yeah. 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 אנשי צפון מרוקו חיו באוויר הקר, ולא באוויר הים תיכוני של מרוקו. והתודעה הזאת של הביטול, לדעתי, היא מאוד מאוד קרובה בזמן. זה לא היה לאורך כל השנים. עד המאה ה-19 רבנים מכל הקהילות באו לשרת בפטואן, בטנג'ר וכו' וכו'. בלי כל בעיה, כי הם ראו בזה ישות דתית אחת. התודעה הזאת של אני והפסיעות, אני אומר זאת במרכאות, של שאני, אני לא רואה את זה בטקסטים, ואני מראה גם, אני אומר להם, רוב הקהילות דוברות הספרדית היו קהילות דו-לשוניות. איך אני יודע? אני לא חייתי שם, אבל... יש לי עשרות כתבי יד שבהם נמצאים שירים בערבית יהודית ליד שירים בספרדית יהודית. מישהו השתמש בהם, מישהו קרא אותם. לא רק זה, זה לא העוול ולא העתקה אוטומטית מכתבי יד אחרים, אלא העתקה מותאמת להגייה המקומית, והגייה של הערבית המקומית בטטואן, של הרשת. We have time for one more question. C'est à propos de ce que vous avez dit, les filles à l'école, il y avait déjà 100 filles à l'école, et à propos des études qu'il fallait faire, il valait mieux être rabbin, il valait mieux être prix Nobel que rabbin. D'abord, j'ai appris du beau-père de Jacques Assouline, le rabbin Isaac Roche qui est présent qui était petit-fils du Roche Yeshiva et Tzraïm de Tlemcen, le rabbin aussi euh, Roche, Tzraïm. Un, que Banecha ou Benotecha, le Shinatam le Banecha, qu'on dit dans le schéma Israël, chez eux, chez Banecha, Vegan Benotecha, c'est-à-dire les garçons, y compris les filles. Ils appartenaient à un monde où la Mechitsa était placée par les femmes et les hommes étaient de l'autre côté. Et pas comme aujourd'hui, les hommes mettent la Mechitsa et ils jettent les femmes de l'autre côté. Et il y a eu à partir de 1862, euh, oui, s'ils veulent là, ils peuvent être là, s'ils ne veulent pas être là, ils peuvent partir. C'est nous, les femmes, comme Sarah, Rivka et, les, et Rachel. La deuxième chose à propos des études, et ce qu'on appelle la Moderna 1862, il y avait déjà une perception que l'éducation apporterait la fin de l'exil. C'est-à-dire aujourd'hui où le monde depuis Casablanca jusqu'à Bagdad est ravagé, moins le Maroc à cause des Américains, Moshe Dayan, je ne rentre pas dedans. À partir de l'Algérie jusqu'à Bagdad, tout est ravagé, il n'y a plus un seul juif là-bas. 1000 au Maroc, 1200 au Maroc, Djerba 800, Tunis 3 400, n'est-ce pas Cette volonté de faire des études, et M. Georges Benchoussan en parle, c'est l'étude et l'éducation qui a coupé, si vous voulez, le lien. Donc, va à l'école, tu rencontreras le Messie. Alors, dans le monde ultra-orthodoxe qui est enfermé dans ses yeshivotes, ils ne connaissent pas le principe 
de « on ne peut pas faire des omelettes sans casser des œufs », tandis que les rabbins du Maroc savent qu'il y a un prix à payer, comme ils disaient, quand tu vas chercher du charbon chez le charbonnier, tu vas salir tes chaussures, mais tu as besoin du charbon. Donc si vous voulez, c'est ça qui fait en sorte que, comme m'a dit une fois Casablanca en 78, quand je suis allé chercher mes parents qui faisaient partie du Mossad, c'est-à-dire de la Raliya, il y a venu Dirna, je ne comprenais pas l'arabe parce qu'on parle de judo-espagnol, « Mon fils, que fais-tu ici ?» Quand je dis pourquoi, « Mon fils, ici, il n'y a pas d'avenir. » Une femme juive qui, sans me voir de dos, mais s'était adressée avec moi. Donc l'éducation amène, si vous voulez, cette coupure entre le monde arabe, et c'est ça le Messie. Bien sûr, on a eu Vichy, bien sûr, on a l'assimilation, bien sûr, on a des juifs qui vous disent « Moi, je ne suis pas juif, je suis français » ou comme ça, mais c'est ça qui a fait en sorte que... Et l'Algérie, bien sûr, sont arrivés d'Algérie au Maroc, des éducateurs comme M. Seban, comme le rabbin Azan, comme le rabbin Isaac Rouch, qui ont éduqué tout le temps qu'on pouvait avant de monter en Israël ou de s'éparpiller pour survivre. Voilà. Et maintenant, pour moi, la preuve que vous êtes ici, c'est bien qu'on continue ce tarif d'indépendance au niveau de Nord-Afrique. Yes, qui se fait aussi yes, par le champ yes, ici, par M. Yossi Ochana, qui Attends. travaille lui dans le champ, dans vos recherches, pour cette indépendance, si vous voulez, de nos communautés. Thank you very much. We need to wrap up the session. We have um, equally interesting sessions waiting for us. Just two announcements. Um, anybody who's registered for the Bas de Chay Fatima, we're leaving promptly at 7 o'clock. כל מי שנרשם להסעה, נא להגיע בזמן, אנחנו יוצאים בשבע בדיוק על מנת להספיק את המושב הראשון בחיפה, פינת קק"ל אוסישקין, ובגלל שאנחנו רוצים לסגור פה קצת עיכובים, המושב הבא יתחיל בדיוק בעוד חמש דקות, כלומר שתים עשרה חמישים ושמונה. תודה.